Hello, I am Bill Watcott, and you are listening to Catholic versus Protestant. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe what it is that you believe. Okay, I guess uh, who I am. I, I would call myself a flawed Christian and a fairly outspoken Christian activist. I grew up in southern Ontario to, I guess, in a broken home. Uh, my mother was alcoholic. Uh, my father and mother divorced when I was age six. And I never saw my dad growing up until I think uh, about 19 was when I saw him after age six. I went into a life of crime. And at that time, I was an atheist uh, and a socialist. And I would say that I became that way as a result of social workers and public school experience. And that was really the only uh, worldview that I knew. I guess at age 18, I started thinking there had to be more. The Salvation Army guy in a young offenders facility, his name was Bob Tuners. Uh, he shared the gospel with me. And even though I didn't respond at the time, or I actually responded negatively and gave him a very hard time, I did think to myself he had something that I didn't. At age 18, I passed from atheism to theism, uh, leaning towards Christianity. I remember this one uh, young 16-year-old prostitute who I was doing drugs with. Uh, she was reading a satanic Bible, and I thought to myself, um, you know, if I'm going to go for a religion, it won't be Satanism. I, I just said that to myself uh, quietly. I kind of rejected it. Uh, of course, I was a messed up guy, too, and obviously that's why I was hanging around people like her. Probably about three weeks after she was reading that Bible, uh, I decided, because I was a lost cause, even though I was looking looking for Christianity, I just decided I was going to do a mass uh, mall shooting. And thank God it, it didn't work out, but I approached someone to buy an illegal gun to carry it out, and I had a friend who, who was going to help me with that. Um, he's dead today. He died at age 29. But anyways, we were waiting for the firearm, and perhaps it's a lesser of evil, but thank God a, a drug dealer came by, and I was a drug addict. I had a few hundred dollars for the gun, but we decided to buy 50 hits of LSD instead. And then myself and my aspiring co-shooter took 25 hits each. We, we actually went into a psychosis, and we were both malnourished, keep that in mind. Uh, we were living on the streets and doing a lot of drugs, and even though at that point I had a lot of money, it was easy come, easy go. Uh, we were often not, not eating right. I think I was um, 150 pounds and Matthew was about 130. And we were so violent on the LSD that it took six police officers a full half hour to get us into the back of their police cruisers. And they were beating us with batons. And these were big men, probably all of them were 200 pounds plus if memory serves me. And a lot of my memory was in and out because of the psychosis of the LSD. But they were tiring. They were hitting us so much that some of them would tire and have to step out of, of the fight, which is basically what it was. Um, I don't remember it, but I was told that I crawled up the back of one police officer. And Matthew, who was 130 pounds and all of 5'9", picked up one police officer and put him over the hood of a cruiser. Uh, one officer joined us in the hospital, and they continued to beat us in the hospital. Because I was a street kid and often in the hospital and often in trouble with the law, uh, the emergency knew me by name, and they really didn't want to keep me. So they actually threw me out about six hours later, and I was still hallucinating. I lost my shoes in the park where we were fighting with the police. My T-shirt was covered with blood. My eyeballs were dilated. Uh, there was blood all in my hair. It was actually standing up like a parakeet. My hair was a little bit long at that time. Blood all over my face. And the hospital just, just kicked me out. They were tired of seeing me. I was probably there every month almost if I wasn't in jail on overdoses usually. And um, I thought to myself, I'm no good for nothing. And this is in spite of being psychotic on LSD. And I, I blew my mind and I'm never coming back. Uh, that was another thought. Uh, and I said, I might as well just, just kill myself and take it like a man. So anyways, um, I ran down the street to this bridge in Adelaide. It's, it's called the Adelaide Street Overpass. And I got up to the bridge. It was about four in the morning, I think, or two in the morning, perhaps. And I decided I was going to jump over and end it all. And that was the first time that I really prayed, even though I was, I was 
not a Christian, not a still considered myself an atheist searching perhaps. And I remember this, this profound sense of despair settled over me. And even though I had no biblical knowledge, I really knew nothing about Christianity beyond this Salvation Army worker asking me to accept Christ and me refusing. Uh, and yet, and yet I had, which I believe today, 40, you know, I guess it'd be about 35 years later, I believe that, that, that even though it was a feeling, it was probably a little more than a feeling, it was almost palpable, the sense that I was going to be eternally separated from God. I knew that within myself. And I think that transcended the drug overdose. And I just said, God, I wish it didn't have to end this way. But I was so hopeless that I saw no other way out of this. And I was just waiting for a car to come. And one, and one was coming. You could see the headlights. And I was just going to drop in front of that car. And this uh, police officer, some people could say it was simply chance. It would be very slim chance. I would say that the odds of him showing up there was commensurate with winning the lottery because it's, you know, two to four in the morning and not a lot of police officers are going over that bridge. But this this officer just just came by as I was ready to jump and, and I had my leg over and I was just letting the car get a little bit closer to jump in front of it to make sure that I hit the pavement and then had the car run over me to make sure it was permanent. And the officer grabbed me by the scuff of my neck and pulled me back. And then he asked me what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I was still wired out on the LSD. I, I just told him me and Matt did 25 hits. We, we did 25 hits each. I bought 50 hits of LSD. The guy looked at me covered in blood and dilated eyes, and he decided to take me back to the hospital. And they kept me on the psychiatric ward for one more day and then kicked me out again. A social worker took me to his house, actually. Uh, this poor social worker, very well-meaning guy, uh, definite leftist. I uh, had a theory that I'd get better if I quit taking LSD and glue. I was into glue sniffing then and just 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 smoked marijuana with him. Uh, needless to say, the experiment didn't work out, but but he meant well. And when he saw that I was overdosed and in the hospital and the hospital wanted to send me somewhere, he decided to take me for a few days. Um, he drove me up to Sudbury because he was going to university there. And there was nothing nothing for me up there. I didn't know how to work. I didn't didn't even know how to look for a job in those days. I was 18. Uh, but I remember asking him, uh, his name was Mark. I remember going, Mark, what do you think of Jesus Christ? Because of Bob Tuners, the, the, the Salvation Army worker. And Mark was a very educated guy. He had a degree, I believe, in Native Studies. He was actually Native. And he had a social work degree. And he was working in this facility that I was locked up in. That, that, that's how he knew me. And then I guess he stayed in touch with me when I was on the street. And I remember he said, you know, I think Jesus was a good man, but he was only a man. And usually everything Mark said, I accepted as gospel. Like he told me we should be pro-choice. So I was pro-choice. Abortion, I never gave it another thought. Mark said it was pro-choice and therefore it was. Uh, you know, he would say we needed universal Medicare, universal uh, guaranteed income. And, and I just accepted all these socialist ideas because Mark was smart. When he said Jesus Christ was only a man, I didn't argue with him because I seldom ever did. But I thought to myself, that's not good enough. That's not a good enough answer. And so I'd say that that, that suicide attempt that was very close to being a success moved me from atheism to looking for God. And I left Mark after a couple days. And even though I was still hallucinating, I, I hitchhiked across the country literally looking for God. And, um, you know, I, I know that's probably not the smartest way to go about it, but it's all I knew what to do. So I, I, I hitchhiked to um, Regina, Saskatchewan. And I remember sitting in the back of a Salvation Army church there. I don't remember anything else about it. Different Christians picked me up, uh, some Pentecostal truckers, and they shared how Christ took them out of alcohol addiction and, and whatnot. I worked for a little while when I was out in the out on the prairies at this uh, mobile home park, and you know I was still dealing with my glue and and drugs, uh, but I was working and making money rather than stealing it, I suppose. And then and then I hitchhiked to Windsor, and I don't know why. It was just I, I didn't have any roots. Uh, I didn't have any family per se. My mother was an alcoholic, so I didn't want to live with her. And my dad, I didn't talk to for years by then, and. You know, the network of social workers that I kind of knew, well, you know, they, they had their lives. 
And Mark didn't really want to keep me around too much as I was uh, overdosing and fighting with cops. So I hitchhiked to Windsor and I was uh, actually sleeping in the homeless shelter there. I was 18 years old now. And um, I would say it's a miracle. I, I, I decided one day to, to try to sniff glue. And um, it, what it is, it's the two lane and acetone that poisons you and messes up your brain. It actually kills a lot of brain cells. Uh, but it very quickly gets you hallucinating. And this one day, like I like I went really low. All my money was gone by the time I got to Windsor. I was I was actually had no friends, no family. My shoes were tattered. Now I had the Salvation Army donated clothes, uh, and I had it all covered in glue. I wasn't cleaning my clothes very often. You know, I I just really really went down, and I was a very lonely 18 year old and. The only thing I knew to do at this point was uh, find pop bottles and panhandle and put the money together to sniff glue. And that's all I did from morning to night. And um, at one point, some police officers were pouring glue on my head and making fun out of me when I was sitting on heaps of garbage in a back alley. One time when I was in the back alley, a garbage man came and took the garbage on the right and on the left and left me sitting on the bags uh, that I was sitting on. But anyways, one day I found myself in a graveyard of all places, and I wrote a book called Born in a Graveyard, which goes into my conversion a little bit. In this graveyard, I was trying to sniff glue, and something, a wall, I would suggest God, but I can't prove it. Just like I can't prove it was the hand of God that saved me on the bridge, I simply believe it was, and the probabilities would lend its way that way, I think. But this one day... I tried to sniff glue and I had 10 tubes, which is enough to keep you intoxicated all day. And I was trying to sniff it and the fumes would not enter my lungs. I was just huffing and huffing and huffing and I was as straight as a whistle or straight as a, as a line, I suppose. And it got me very frustrated because my life was pretty painful. It was pretty lonely. Um, the addiction was taking a toll on me physically. And I really wanted to get high and escape everything. And when I was sober, after about 10 minutes of huffing and puffing and going through all 10 tubes of glue, because not one tube worked, I just started crying. And then I, I looked at these tombstones. It was actually an old graveyard in uh, Windsor on a street called Ottawa Street. And a lot of the tombstones were from the 19th century. And when I was in uh, juvenile, I read a lot of Canadian history over and above what would be required of people there. In fact, most people there aren't really readers, uh, but a few of the social workers knew I was a reader and they'd bring me stuff to read. And I especially liked history. And, and, and I knew that that was a more Christian time. I, don't, I wouldn't say it was perfect. I'm sure there was lots of sin and licentiousness in the 19th century, but it was a cleaner time and a more God-fearing time than the 1980s, which is what we're talking about, July 1986. That's when I was in that graveyard. And, and then I just said, these were better people than me. Whether that was true or not is irrelevant. Uh, we'll never know. They've been dead for a long time, and I never talked to them. But uh, then, I, then, I, then for the first time in my life, because you got to realize when you're in the youth justice system and you're dealing with social workers, one of the mantras for young offenders is you're a victim. You know, you got an alcoholic mother, but you're basically a good person. You're only stealing. You're only beating people up because you're, you're a victim. There is very little emphasis on taking responsibility and, and fixing yourself. I had a very high expectation in those days that the government should fix me. And I didn't have a great expectation, and I didn't even know how to have an expectation on taking steps to fix myself. And, for, and, 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 and it was like, like just, just quite the revelation that I was a sinner, I was promiscuous, I was dishonest, I was violent, I was a thief. And as I thought about all my sins, I just started weeping. And, and that day, I asked Christ to come into my heart and to forgive me of my sins. And I walked out of that, that graveyard clean on the inside, which is something that, that never happened uh, ever in my life. And, um, and, and, I, and I bawled for like two hours. It was quite, quite loud and quite profound. I guess being a graveyard, uh, nobody noticed, and perhaps there was not even anyone there, it seems, from my memory. But, but, but when I walked out of that graveyard, I was clean. Now, I didn't know what to do, and I wish I could tell you that, that it was a clean-cut conversion and life was perfect after that. For a couple days, I was going to the homeless shelter, and I felt really close to God, and I was walking and talking with Him. But by about the third or fourth day, the mundane realities 
of being a homeless kid with no job skills set in. And I went back to what I knew, the glue sniffing. But I couldn't really um, enjoy it the same way. And God, I think, is, is a God that doesn't leave us uh, once, he, once he comes to us. Uh, one day when I was in a Salvation Army drop-in center, I found a little testimony from a place called Teen Challenge. And it was a testimony of mostly adults, they weren't actually teens, that, that had conversions uh, to Christ and were set free from their drug and alcohol addictions through the work of Teen Challenge. And this track had a little address on the back uh, in, in Hamilton. And I just knew that's where I had to go. So literally that day, I grabbed my bag out of the hostel where I was sleeping and hitchhiked to Hamilton. And there uh, I got into Teen Challenge after three weeks of waiting on the streets. And it's there that a lot of my, my, my formation came. My political orientation changed to a more conservative outlook. Um, I became pro-life. I discovered that babies were, were human beings uh, when they were unborn and that killing them was murder. You know, my, my, my whole understanding of right and wrong and my need to repent and, and to give to society rather than just expect the government to give to me or people to give to me. There was a great change in my life at that point. Once again, it wasn't all clean cut. After four months of the rigor, because Teen Challenge is unlike any secular government-funded drug rehab, you had to be up at 8 in the morning praying. You know, you had breakfast at, at 8.30. I think by 9, you were scrubbing floors and doing chores around uh, Teen Challenge. Uh, they made you work. And after four months of that kind of rigor, I kind of wanted to go back to the easier I backslid, I suppose. I left Teen Challenge, and thankfully I didn't go to glue, but I had to do another run with drugs and promiscuity and discovered I didn't like any of it and uh, committed the worst crime of my life. I tried to hijack a bus and run it into the wall of the London police station, and uh, God in his mercy, uh, I wasn't able to, to actually get the bus moving. In those days, I didn't know anything about air brakes, thankfully, and got uh, 15 months in jail, which was very, very light sentence for, for the crime I did. But out of that, six months of it I spent in segregation. And there I was reading the Bible every day. And there a uh, Anglican priest would come and visit me. Or actually, he was a, more an Anglican chaplain. I don't even think he was ordained. Uh, I don't remember his name, but he visited me once a week. And uh, even though I was praying and reading the Bible, I was still cutting myself and still acting out and uh, pointed a weapon at a at another inmate and that I fashioned out of a spoon. I made a knife and gave a death threat to a guard and signed it in my own blood. And so you, you wouldn't think that God was working in me, but he was. When I was in segregation at one point after I assaulted an inmate that I was able to reach when they let me out of my cell for a few minutes, the inmates were a little bit afraid of me, some of them. I, and I wasn't a tough guy. I was actually a small fish in that place. It's just I acted out enough that I got some respect. But um, I, I actually used that to enforce uh, the radio. I said that we're not going to be listening in this range to, to the rock music that was normally on it. And I had a guard put it on Focus on the Family. Focus on the Family was a really good pro-family evangelical program. Millions upon millions of people listened for years. And I think it's still going, Focus on the Family, although Dr. Dobson is no longer a part of it. But he would talk about marriage. He'd talk about pro-life. He would tie in morality and faith. And that's not the kind of thing that would ever be playing in a prison, let alone a segregation unit. But for about a month, I had all the guys quiet, and we would listen as Dr. Dobson went over these, these topics. And nobody really argued about it. Everybody was, was quite happy to listen to him. One, one interview that he did that I remember when I was in um, segregation was actually with a mass murderer, you might know his name, Ted Bundy. Dr. Dobson interviewed Ted Bundy 21 hours before he was executed. And Bundy said everybody on death row that is there for serial killing like himself had a porn addiction. And that had a huge impact on me because I thought sex was recreational. That's what I learned. You know, when I got out of got out of jail. I, I, I still struggle with drugs for a while, but I kept trying to go to church. That's the one thing I tried to do. And I was there a lot. And I'd wound up in jail a few more times. Like I said, my conversion 
wasn't uh, St. Paul on the road to Damascus, unfortunately. It was probably more a combination of Samson and King David. A lot of repentance in there and a lot of hard lessons that had to be learned. By 1989, I turned away from the criminal lifestyle and drugs for good and uh, found myself at a Pentecostal church called Stone Church in, in Toronto. I was homeless, but I was determined not to steal at this point. God uh, worked in my heart quite a bit. And, and I remember I just said, Lord, I got no money and I got nowhere to live, but I don't want to commit a crime. I just want to trust you. And that day I, I uh, panhandled in front of the bus station and I raised something like $100, which was quite a bit. And I met this lady, Joanne. She became my, my, my first girlfriend. It didn't work out too good, but she was a Christian and she certainly... Um, started me on, on the road to normalcy. Uh, she was the one that was taking me to Stone Church. And then me, I was really quite evangelical at this time. So I was bringing about five or six guys from the youth hostel every week. And a lot of people noticed that at Stone Church, that I was bringing these people and that I was on fire for God. And um, I got a lot of support from people in that church, including Joanne, even though we, we broke up eventually. And be, thanks to them, I, I got myself a place and I got into Humber College and became a nurse. I actually graduated from the practical nursing program with, with honors. And that's where uh, the path that led to, to finding your friend Mark, Kevin Mark, uh, led. Because there I got introduced to pro-life. When you're nursing, you're dealing with, with life issues. And the place was overwhelmingly, even in the 90s, pro-abortion. And I defended life, and that raised quite a few eyebrows amongst the staff and, and students. Joanne actually took me to uh, Parliament Hill one day before we parted ways uh, to a protest for life. And there I wept for the babies when I started thinking Canada was killing 100,000 babies. And so when I got out of nursing and I wanted to give back because I received a lot, you know, I really had to be grateful to to the Christian faith and to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that I got out of drugs and became a nurse and graduated with honors, you know, I felt I had to give something back. And the door that the Lord opened up for me was pro-life. I got involved with a ministry called Aid to Women, and there I was uh, counseling, uh, you know, women. And I'm very, very pleased to say that God used me to save a few lives in that time. Um, I was also picketing on the street with the graphic abortion signs. One time I went to jail for six months, which blew me away for peacefully standing on a sidewalk and praying with an abortion sign in front of a clinic. When I was a real criminal, I never had the courts go that, that psychotic on me. They were often giving me unreasonably light sentences. But years later, when I showed up as an accomplished nurse with a nonviolent act of civil disobedience. <laughs> I was getting sentences that were more uh, severe than what I got for, for, you know, stealing cars. So yeah, yeah, that was quite an eye opener. Then I realized there was an ideological, you know, culture war going on and that the judges were very much on the other side. And I would say that that pro-death bias uh, infects the bench right from the provincial court right up to the Supreme Court. And um, I, I became a VON nurse, even in spite of that. And um, I worked with the VON uh, casually by choice because I'd frequently wind up in the slammer for a few days and my boss would know all about it. And she would usually just say to me when I had a caller, because I'd have a shift the next day and I had no idea when I was getting out, you know, she would just say, don't tell me where you are and don't tell me what you're doing. You have an unpaid leave of absence. Just give me a call when like, you're available again. And she'd usually hang up because she'd be pissed off. She had a hard time replacing me. But I think she had an element of respect for what I was doing, even though she herself told me she was pro-choice but cared about cats and tried to tell me that you know she'd never commit civil disobedience for a cat. I told her I agree with you. Neither would I. <laughs> but, you know... You know, she did have a measure of respect, and she never she never fired me in the five years that I was there. And I think I wound up in jail for 20 times for anywhere from that six months to one day to 15 days to a week. You know, it was all over, all over the map. But anyways, from there, I moved on to uh, Saskatchewan. And in Saskatchewan, I got involved uh, 
with the pro-life, pro-family movement, I became a little more outspoken on the homosexual issue. My concern there was that at that point, that was about the year 2001, they were starting to push homosexuality in the public schools on kids. And uh, that became a concern to me, even though I was certainly still involved with pro-life. I was showing the, the abortion signs around Saskatchewan and I was getting arrested again. And I ran for mayor of Regina on the promise of zoning uh, Planned Parenthood and the abortion clinic uh, operating at the Regina General Hospital out of city limits. And I was going to end the funding to the Gay Pride Parade. Interestingly, part of why I moved to Saskatchewan is I thought they'd be a little more conservative than downtown Toronto. Now, for all the years I was with the VON and they knew what I was doing during my time off work, they never tried to take my livelihood away from me. I and mean, in fact, they accommodated me uh, more than I would have expected. Once I got to Saskatchewan, indeed, people were a little more conservative, but they were also a lot, a lot less tolerant of that kind of activism. And even though I was very careful to never bring my views to work, when I wound up in the newspaper for running for mayor and when I wound up in the paper for uh, picketing the Regina Public Library when they had this hideous, hideous cinema called Queer City Cinema, where they were actually uh, showing pro-pedophile videos to the public, and some of them with graphic sex acts that would constitute a criminal offense. When, when I was picketing these things, all of a sudden, I started getting uh, disciplined for this and that, and the disciplines were often unjustified, and, and they were coming very frequently. And, and in fact, the Regina General Hospital, or sorry, the Regina Wiscana Rehab Center is where I was working at that time in Regina, they, they actually decided they were going to get me fired and get my license stripped. It took them a few years to finally drive me out. I fought that thing, but it was a horrible time. You could often cut the tension on the nurses' unit with a knife when I'd walk in. There were some lovely nurses there that, that were actually quietly sympathetic towards me, and one nurse even put her job on the line to testify in my defense that I was not this horrible nurse that, that they were trying to make me out to be. She got fired two years later, and I suspect that was because she spoke out in defense of me. Actually, they, they had an NDP government at the time. And when the NDP is your employer, because the Regina Health District, unlike uh, liberal Toronto, where you had a lot of private health care options, in Regina, your only employer as a nurse was the Regina Health District. And the government at that time, your boss, was the NDP. And uh, they worked very hard to get rid of me. And, and eventually, after three years, they did. That was quite a loss of standard of living for me. Uh, that was the first really really good job I had. I, I had to move to Alberta to get a job because I was so notorious with my graphic abortion signs and speaking out against homosexuality. I should mention by now I got dragged before the Saskatchewan Human Rights Tribunal and I was found guilty of discrimination for saying uh, that it was wrong to push uh, homosexuality in public schools and I gave a whole list of um, you know diseases that I knew as a nurse homosexuals were prone to. I looked after a lot of homosexual patients when I was working with the VON downtown. I certainly didn't hate them, but I could see it was self-evident that the behavior was very destructive. You know, and I certainly was an outspoken young guy. I put in the Bible verses and the biblical word sodomite on my flyers, and I guess the learned judges uh, decided that was hate speech, and I was fined 17000 $500 in order to never uh, speak on that topic again. Me being who I was, I broke the uh, human rights order the following day and put out a thousand flyers in, in Saskatoon, even though I was living in Alberta. I actually, the day I got the order, drove to Saskatoon. And that night went from about nine o'clock at night till about eight in the morning and put out a thousand flyers in mailboxes, uh, sodomites in the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission with a diatribe on how they're attacking truth and liberty and promoting an unhealthy and ungodly lifestyle, and on and on it went. That battle went on to the Supreme Court. I actually won in the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, and I was really thanking God for that and looked at that as a gift to all of Canada, that uh, there would be a degree of religious freedom and free speech on this topic. Unfortunately, when the other side, when the Human Rights Tribunal appealed to the Canadian Supreme Court, they, they took it, and then they unanimously uh, ruled against me. And I would argue that Canada that day really lost its free speech. Uh, 
the bar for, for hate speech is, is very low and very subjective. And if you're going to talk on this topic at all, you really don't know where you're going to be leaving free speech and entering hate speech. And, and that ambiguity is, is really a sad thing. I got into other things. I ran for mayor of uh, Edmonton, certainly put out a lot more flyers on the threat that I perceived to homosexual activism and, uh, and Canada's religious and political liberty. I, I worked my way up from $9 an hour labor jobs, got myself a class one and became a truck driver. Unfortunately, I went through a couple marriages and struggled with a sexual addiction, even as a Christian. And that was a very damaging part of my life and certainly it caused harm to other people as well. And, uh, you know, I never I never went the way I was as an atheist, but that that part of my life has been far from perfect. Eventually, I went moved on to, to B.C. There I made a plan to infiltrate the homosexual pride parade. And I guess that's how Kevin Mark came to know me. And uh, I infiltrated one parade in Vancouver as the Calgary Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. I should uh, note that I applied to March as a openly Christian man and was not accepted. But once I applied as a gay high priest of this fictitious cult, I was embraced. And I put out uh, 2,500 gospel condoms in the parade. Now, even though I'm evangelical, I believe contraception is a sin. Very much I'm with the Catholics on that one. My condoms did not have latex in them. They looked like condoms. I put an $8 price tag on them so that way nobody would throw them out. I gave them out for free. And it said, Pure Pleasure $8. That was my brand. And I got these into the hands of 2,500 homosexuals in the Pride Parade. I had pink hair and a fairy cape and short shorts as I was handing these things out. You can see the pictures. They're still on the internet afterwards. Uh, The police started looking for me because some of the homos were opening up their uh, pure pleasure condoms on the parade route. And then when they got them, uh, they were getting the testimony of a man who left the homosexual lifestyle and uh, 30 years later is still married to the same woman and has nine kids, living proof that Christ can change sexual behavior. I had all the diseases, all the relevant Bible verses in the gospel that God loves you, and if you turn to him, you can be saved. And uh, this this started freaking people out. So while I was dancing on the uh, parade route, police were, were looking for me. And I was actually photo opping with them. And I was also photo opping with one of the NDP politicians, uh, Herbert Chander Spencera. Him and the cop are still on the front page of my website on the Vancouver uh, Pride Parade stunt. And uh, there, there's me with the pink hair. The reason why I pulled that off was because St. Paul said, be all things to all people that you can save some. Well, they were just not accepting open Christians on the parade route. But as a gay high priest of the Calgary Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, they accepted me and my activists, and they received their pure pleasure packages. And when they opened them, they got the gospel. So that was such a success that a couple years later, I applied in the uh, Toronto Pride Parade. Uh, first, I applied as a openly Christian man. And the Toronto Pride Parade said, I'm not welcome in the 2016 parade, and nor would I be welcome in any subsequent parade after that. They knew my name. They knew my Supreme Court case and all that. So once again, I was forced to become a, a closet case. I went into the closet and hid my Christianity. And then I applied as the Gay Zombie uh, Cannabis Consumers Association. And needless to say, the Pride Parade welcomed me with open arms. So I got uh, six Christians, all to dress up in zombie outfits. I have one. I had one, too. I had zombie uh, green outfit, and then I was wearing a rainbow tutu, and I had little gay pride earrings sticking out of the side of my zombie costume. And then I made a new condom package. It was called... Zombie safe sex, $5. Now, once again, as a Christian who does not believe in condoms, and as a nurse, as a nurse, I saw I saw firsthand in my own clinical practice the, the effects of condom failure. I saw it. I saw the, the herpes. I saw other STDs from people that were educated to the hill on condoms. I remember one time when I was working on the street, this one prostitute came in. I refused to hand out the condoms. And there was a social worker there who was handing them out in my stead. And this one prostitute said, one of my condoms broke. 
Like, what happens if that guy had HIV? You know, she was done. So I know that latex was madness. But my zombie safe sex package had the gospel in it again. And so I got out 3,000 of those on the Toronto parade route. And uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of gospel information that went out and a lot of reaction in the parade. And, and actually, quite amazing reaction. In the days uh, following my stunt, I got out of town and uh, three very powerful gay activists, Doug Elliott, George Smitherman, who is the former deputy premier of Ontario, and another gay activist that I wasn't so familiar with, but he, he was, he actually did have some standing in the homosexual activist movement. His name was uh, Hudspis, Christopher Hudspis, who ran a gay bar and I guess litigated a few cases with Elliot on same-sex postal benefits in years previous. Well, these guys were so incensed that I used the mechanism of their parade to bring the gospel to 3,000 attendees and naked people too. I got some of my zombie safe sex packages in the hands of naked marchers. And you can see a few uh, pictures of that on my website. That's freenorthamerica.ca for your listeners. They actually went to Parliament Hill. Now keep in mind, my operating budget was like a couple thousand dollars. We made all these zombie safe sex packages in various kitchens. My, my stunt was a low budget stunt. Nobody died, nobody got punched out. Uh, the parade went on. There was people marching in the parade with pictures of our Lord on their crotch. Others were naked with dog collars. All their debauchery was was there, funded by you and me with tax dollars. And yet they were so incensed that I brought the gospel to their parade that they went to Parliament Hill and announced a $104 million lawsuit against me. And indeed, they tried to enforce it. That was one of the, the legal battles of my life, God miraculously, because I'm a pretty low-budget guy since I lost my, my nursing career. I've never had a steady income since, and doing this activism does not get you rich. Um, they certainly got me heavenly rewards and lawsuits and jail time. But yeah, yeah, they, they launched this, this $104 million class action lawsuit, and they actually had Justin Trudeau and Kathleen Wynne, your former lesbian premier of Ontario, they were actually named as complainants in this lawsuit. And then the Liberal Party as a class was harmed by my flyer, according to the lawsuit, because I said unflattering things about the Liberals and their homosexual activism and their support for a low age of consent and, and the fact that their deputy premier was uh, convicted of child pornography. That was Benjamin Levine. He did three years in jail for it, and his paw prints are all over Ontario's current sex ed curriculum to this day. Then also the marchers were, were a harmed class, so they couldn't really find any victims to talk about how their life fell apart, but they were named as a class anyways because of my, my stunt. And then I guess all the, the spectators. So none of these people even necessarily consented to this lawsuit, but they were all named as a class that was harmed by me. Uh, ostensibly, there's a quarter of a million people in this parade, and I managed on reaching 3,000, which might be a little over 1%, but they, they tried to sue me. For two years, this, this lawsuit went nowhere. They tried to force me on pain of going to jail to reveal the name of my friends who helped me out. Uh, to this day, the lawsuit is still going, and to this day, I'm refusing to reveal the identity of my friends because they, they just want to take their RSPs and homes and make an example of them. And you're talking moms with kids. You're talking Christian uh, senior citizens, people who volunteered for maybe one hour. Elliot said on Parliament Hill, anyone who gave Dill Watcott so much as a cup of water will be on the hook for a $100 million lawsuit. That's what he announced. Uh, but anyways, he hasn't found anyone, and he sure spent a lot of money trying. When the lawsuit was failing and the and the Ontario Liberal government was in its final days, two years after my zombie gospel stunt, they were still so bitter that they actually put a Canada-wide arrest warrant out for me. Now, at this time, I was up in Fort McMurray. I long forgot about my zombie stunt. Um, well, you know, I'd think about it and think, well, that was a nice thing I did. I got a lot of gospel out to homosexuals and sure pulled one over on them. Because keep in mind, homosexuals infiltrate our church. They infiltrate Christian ministries and sow chaos on purpose. Uh, 
you know, you know, it's 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 a rough and tumble world in the activist world. And in my experience, gay activists are often far less charitable than Christian ones. And they're usually more successful. So it's kind of nice that I pulled one on them and and I gave them information they needed. I gave them health risk of their behavior. I gave them the stats on their social maladaptation. I warned them that there is an eternal hell for those who will reject Christ and continue to pursue their sexual rebellion. And then I gave them the gospel that they can come to Christ and provided them testimonies of people who left the gay and transgender lifestyle and reclaim their God-given sexuality, in some cases being married and having children. Uh, but anyways, that was all so bad that they finally put out a Canada-wide arrest warrant. And now uh, I'm on my way to court in January 6th, so I can certainly use prayers from your listeners, charged with a, with a hate crime, and the Crown uh, prosecutor is looking for 18 months in jail. So strangely, when I tried to run a bus into the wall, of a police station 30 years ago as a pagan. They were all good with that and only gave me 15 months. But putting the gospel into the hands of 3,000 homosexuals is a crime so serious that now they got to put me away for 18 months. The law is not on their side, and I know I'm biased, you know, because obviously I'm the one going to jail. But I would just encourage you and your listeners to look at the section I'm charged under, Section 319 of the criminal code and look at subsections one, two, and three. There's specific religious defense. There's a specific truth defense. You can, uh, you'll have a hard time finding my flyer. Uh, the Crown attorney uh, forced me to take it off my, my uh, website or I was going to have to stay in jail until my hearing. Mass Resistance has my flyer on their website in the United States. So if you look there and you see my flyer, you will see facts. You'll see gospel. You know, if you're an impartial person and you look at it, I don't think you can find a lot of so-called hate speech. Uh, certainly nothing that rises to Section 319, 1, 2, and 3. That being said, if I was a betting man, I think 75% I'll be going to jail simply because the issue is gay and I'm a Christian. Honestly, I don't have faith in our courts to rule on the law or to be impartial. I've, I've seen it. When I got the six months in jail, uh, at that time, Saben Robinson was chaining himself to trees off in Clockwood Sound. He was getting $100 fines for trespassing on private property and chaining himself to trees where people are trying to work. Me, I merely stood on a sidewalk and prayed, a public sidewalk. I did not block anyone. I simply refused to leave when the police told me to leave. I told them I need to pray for the babies and hold my sign, abortion kills children. That's what my sign said. And for that simple act of defiance, I didn't resist the police when they put me in handcuffs. And uh, I got six months. So what you're saying is you had a pretty uneventful run-of-the-mill life. <laughs> no, my life is, is interesting, <laughs> uh, needless to say. <laughs> so uh, who, who uh, it sounds a little bit like you're on your own, other than a few anonymous people who are willing to help you out once in a while. Who can you point to that's really making uh, the sort of wild efforts that you're making? Are there any names, uh, household names yeah, that you could mention? there is. Uh, Maximilian Kobe giving up his life to save a, a Jewish man. That to me is very powerful and his spirituality draws me to him in some ways, even if I'm not necessarily Catholic myself. I've read a lot of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I got some concerns about his neo-orthodoxy. His book, Ethics, uh, is a great read, and he's a hero. He lost his life trying to take out Hitler in order to save uh, the lives of many. Canadian heroes that are more unknown than Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Maximilian, but I think their place in, in heaven is going to be assured, and I think they'll be sitting at the table with Dietrich and Kobe, would be Linda Gibbons, who has given up uh, more than a decade of her life witnessing in front of abortion clinics in Canada, and she spent more than a decade in jail for peacefully witnessing on the public sidewalk for the unborn. In fact, when I got my six months in jail, I was standing on the sidewalk with her. Yeah, that was the first time I ever went to jail for peaceful civil disobedience and found how harsh the court could be. I believe they gave her six months as well. And then they've given her a year and 18 months, and I think she spent something like 12 or 15 years in jail just for standing on a sidewalk and encouraging mothers to give life to their unborn children. 
Another lady who who really moves me is uh, Mary Wagner. I wrote a story on her. She's a, a Catholic woman, and uh, she walks into the abortion clinics and hands roses to the mothers who are uh, contemplating killing their babies. And I believe she has saved a few lives doing this. And she has been in jail for a number of years, and she might still be there now. And then the last one to really move me would be Randy Elkhorn, a Christian author who has been arrested in Operation Rescue. He he didn't quite quite go to the extremes of myself or Linda Gibbons in terms of the amount of time in jail, but he did spend some time in jail and he wrote some really good books. And then uh, Joan Andrew Bell. Uh, Joan Andrews uh, was a rescuer in the United States and uh, a Florida judge got so upset with her pro-life activism and her and her unwillingness to renounce peaceful civil disobedience that, that he actually sentenced her to five years in a state prison. And then Solzhenitsyn, I've very, very, uh, I, I've, I've read his book, Gulag Archipelical, and his other book, uh, I think it's called Third Circle of Hell, and then A Day in the Life of uh, Ivan Donovich. And his books uh, help me to endure suffering, because he talks about suffering that's even more extreme than what I experienced. So when I do go to jail, I, I don't complain too loudly when I think about his experiences in the Soviet Gulag. I wanted to ask you if you've had any moving testimonies of people that were converted by the work that you've done by the grace of God. Has anyone come forward and said, look, I, I was really lost, but now I'm found and uh, you were instrumental in that change? Have people come forward with those stories? Um, there was a, a lady who was Seventh Day Adventist. She was a black lady and a very proud lady. She walked into Aid to Women by accident one day when I was there, and uh, she was five months pregnant. So she was coming along, you know. She was like 22 weeks, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, at that stage, your 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 fetus is actually viable if it's if it's you know born early for some reason. And uh, when she discovered that she walked into the pro life center by accident, she started running down the stairs. So I had very very few words with her. I think on the upstairs on the main floor, I. I don't remember what I told her, but I, I asked her to sit down and said, look, you know, killing your baby is a serious thing or something to that effect. And she didn't stay for more than a minute. So I didn't say very much. And then as she was running down the stairs, the only thing I could think of, because she did tell me, she, she told me enough that I got the information five and a half months pregnant. I just said, you can feel your baby kicking inside you because as a nurse, I know that uh, gestational stages and what babies can do and at five months you you can kick and a mother will feel it and as i said that she ran out the door and the only thing i did was said a little prayer for her like lord help her to change her heart and you know these are profound life and death things but when you're working at a pro-life crisis pregnancy center and picking picketing on the street these profound things happen every day so that might not affect me as much as it would affect you, perhaps. Uh, I, I forgot about her and life went on, you know, because I met other women killing their babies and talked to other people on the street. And, um, you know, I didn't give her a lot of thought after I prayed for her. And then I think it was like two or three weeks later, I don't know what I was doing, but I was not picketing and I was not around eight to women. I was probably doing an errand because sometimes I was delivering baby food or you know, clothing for mothers who were low income and who did choose life. Or maybe I was working as a nurse my one or two days a week, being a, a casual worker that I was. But anyways, when I came to the pro-life center to aid to women, because I did sleep up in the attic there in those days because I wasn't working much. I was just working enough to feed myself and then do, do the picketing. Anyway, she was there. And like I said, she's a very proud woman. So she kind of stuck her nose up and didn't want to be too friendly to me. But Joanne Dieleman, the director, was just beaming, just just smiling. And she goes, Bill, do you remember this this woman? And I looked at her and kind of thought I might, and I might not remember her. I, I was trying to think of who she was. And then Joanne goes, you spoke to her the words, she can feel her baby kick as she was running down the stairs. And then, and then I remembered that specific incident. And then Joanne said, she went into the abortion clinic but couldn't kill her baby. She, she changed her mind and left. And so there we were putting together a big basket of clothes for her because she was low income. She really didn't want to do this abortion. She was abandoned by her boyfriend, a 
men are a big problem when it comes to to abortion and you know bailing out on their women and their time in need and um you know i i drove her home and so so that was really awesome and that woman stayed in touch with us for a couple of years after that so that was one one thing that i did in this world there's a little kid alive today uh, who would be a young adult now in his 20s and he probably doesn't know who i am and and that's fine but but praise god he's on this earth amazing because, because of that yeah i'm sure you've saved many without knowing it and it's better i guess to have your reward revealed to you in heaven yeah when i show him the dead baby signs that definitely turned some women off of abortion some of them were mad at me for showing it and that's fine uh when i was in jail uh, a black fellow by the name of derek uh he was a raving homosexual you know he gravitated to my bible study that i started at maple Ridge correctional center and his thing was trying to to seduce married men and tragically he he had a, a great degree of success on that which is hard for me to understand. He did have AIDS, or actually, I guess he was HIV, but his HIV was, was fairly advanced when I met him in jail. Uh, he stayed involved in my Bible study for the two months that I was with him. And then I got out, and then I would visit him. Me and another pro-life girl, uh, we would visit him and put 20 bucks in his account and minister to him when he was at jail. When he got out, he came to my church, and I stayed in touch with him for about a year after he got out of jail. Uh, he sang at our church. He had a beautiful singing voice. And then he came to the abortion clinic a few times. He became very pro-life, and he was singing there. You know, just like myself, conversions can be complicated. Uh, he did a heck of a lot better. Now, he never completely overcame his homosexual tendencies. He would fall every four months or so. But I consider that a success because he would have 16 weeks of sexual purity, of sexual sobriety. And this is a guy that would commit two to three homosexual acts a day who would cruise for married men because that was his ultimate kick, who, who, would, who would sodomize many, many times a week. So for him to go 16 weeks clean was a huge success. And then the one day that he would slip up, he had usually phoned me afterwards. And I tell him, well, you know, we all sin. I've sinned. You know, a lot of Christian guys masturbate, that's sin. And I tell him, you know, God is really pleased that you went 16 weeks. Now you gotta repent, because what you did is wrong. I, I never shied from telling him that what he did is wrong, and he didn't need to hear that too much, because he knew already. And then he'd pick himself up again. And, uh, you know, eventually he moved to Halifax. And like I said, his T4 count was quite low uh, the last time I saw him. So he's passed away by now, barring the miracle. Uh, but I, th I think God did do a great work in him, even though it wasn't clean cut, you know. And I think he'll be in heaven. And I praise the Lord that I had that time in his life. Is this what they call hate speech? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, trying. Well, now, 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 you know, uh, our our prime minister, you know, he's got a bill, I think, uh, that he's promising to pass when he, if he gets reelected, where they're going to criminalize conversion therapy. Now, a guy like Derek, he he wanted help, he wanted support to stay out of the homosexual lifestyle. That, my understanding is, is going to be an indictable offense. They're not even going to go summary. They're, they're going to go by indictment, which, if you have American listeners, is the equivalent of a felony, a very serious charge with a lengthy time in jail for whatever Christian therapist dares to help a, a homosexual of their own free will try to break free of these harmful behaviors. Did you ever dabble in same-sex attraction, uh, those sorts of activities, homosexual activities? Yeah. I did. I, w I was actually raped when I was at a uh, halfway house. I guess I didn't consent to that sexual activity, obviously. And then uh, when I was 18, I, I willingly uh, engaged in homosexual activity for cocaine. When I was in prison doing that six months in segregation, there was about a month there where I declared myself gay. Uh, because I was in uh, segregation, I couldn't do anything about it, but I I, I asked the cell partner next to me if I could sodomize him if I ever get a chance, and the guy said yes. Uh, prison is pretty debauched. And then after a month, uh, being gay and liberated just, just kind of faded off. And the truth is, is my sexual preference for the entirety of my life has, has been heterosexual. But, you know, when you're, when you're in immoral situations, 
and you don't have God in your life, your sexual behavior can become malleable. Yeah. And, and mine certainly did. I have a, a sort of unusual take on sexuality, which is that there's sex, which is wholesome and Christian and good. And then everything else is a perversion that's imitating sex in one way or another. And I class all of that as masturbation. Like you can masturbate into your wife's vagina. You can masturbate into your boyfriend's rectum. You can masturbate the old fashioned way uh, with the girly magazine. You can masturbate uh, in group sex. You can masturbate uh, all kinds of ways. They're just different kinds of perversion, different extremes, of course. But uh, I just see everyone on a sort of spectrum of perversion. And my goal as a Christian is to not be perverted at all you know, to have zero perversion. Now, that's hard to achieve because we are in a fallen world and I'm a fallen sinner. So, um, yeah, I just see all perversion on a sort of gradient and you can push the limits uh, depending on if you're risk averse or if you're uh, fond of risk. Would you agree with that assessment? Uh, yeah. And then looking at myself, I don't like risk, but if you don't have any self-control, like a lot of my, uh, a lot of my sexual sin, uh, and it cost me my, my family and cost me uh, a lot of friends in that over the years, but a lot of it was compulsive. So, you know, and I think with a lot of homosexuals that I talked to who were cruising, it was compulsion. Uh, so I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, but, but part of it too is when you give yourself over to Satan, because there is a spiritual component to it, I do think you lose your, your free will. And you're going to take risks to get that need met that you don't really want to take. And you're not going to think of the consequences until later on when they come back to haunt you. So, uh, yeah, it, interestingly, I think St. Paul uh, sums it up quite well. And I believe it's in Romans 8 where he says, you know, professing to become free, they become slaves. You know, and I think uh, one of the easiest ways to become a slave is to try to seek freedom through your sexual appetite by casting off the restraints that God has has wisely put around it, which is lifelong monogamous marriage. Uh, you know, that is, what, as Christians, what we should defend and what we should uh, strive for. And even though in some ways I have no credibility, uh, in other ways God has cleaned me up a lot. And I can I can tell people uh, my own story that that, you know, in seeking to be free, you will become a slave if you walk out of those boundaries that God has created for us. Hmm. Uh, just today, I published an interview with an atheist, and he told me that there have been many studies showing that the more a society indulges in pornography, prostitution, and immoral hobbies, the less risk there is of actual rape and actual pedophilia and actual sex crimes because they have this outlet. I don't think that guy read a real study he, that's just his fantasy <laughs> you know and in fact even in canada's super liberal debauched judicial system uh they got rid of uh, porn out of federal prisons because they found that that was uh creating an appetite for some some unseemly things and i think to this day a lot of parole officers keep their sex offenders away from porn and even for us christians those who sadly commit those crimes because christians are not at all immune what is it that takes us down that road? Usually getting into that porn that your, uh, that your atheist friend claims uh, takes it away. You know, when I looked at porn, I, I know what it did is, is it poured gasoline on my act note. You know, like I've been free of porn for quite a number of years. And that is the one place I cannot go, you know, if I hope to maintain uh, any modicum of self-control. Yeah, so he, he's off in zombie land. That's that, 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 that his atheist uh, fantasy, maybe dressed up with a bit of academic uh, lingo. Hmm. A lot of wishful thinking. If yeah. you don't live as you believe, you soon begin to believe as you live. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, uh, I know a few Christians who decided to give up the struggle. And when you meet them later on, and I have in a couple cases, uh, they've become very worldly and they're no longer feeling guilty about whatever it was they were struggling with. Hmm. We need to end on a little bit of a, of a positive note. So just to wrap up, what do you think you might be able to say to anyone that's out there listening now? Uh, I'm just looking here. There's a, a beautiful scripture in a very um, somber book. Uh, it's called Lamentations, one of the Old Testament uh, scriptures. I'm just looking for it here. Here it is. 
Here it is. I found it. Okay, uh, Lamentations 3.22, and I guess I'll go up to 25. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They grow new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, the good news is that even though we sin and we fall short, God is very merciful. And if you read the book of Lamentations, you can see that our God is just. He will uh, allow us to reap what we sow. Uh, Certainly the Israelites were punished because of their sexual immorality and idolatry and violence and rebellion against God. And yet, and yet the prophet could say, the mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. You know, so um, I think for us, we need to wait, you know, learn that we don't always get uh, instant gratification and put our hope in, in God and his salvation and he won't let us down. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is know.